If you have your Bible, turn to Genesis 1 with me this morning, please. Is that something? <laughs> Genesis 1, verse 1. <laughs> I've seen the Almighty do that time and time and time again. Genesis chapter number 1 and verse 1. In the beginning God created the heaven and the earth, and the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. And God said, Let there be light, and there was light. And God saw the light, that it was good, and God divided the light from the darkness, and God called the light day, and the darkness he called night, and the evening and the morning were the first day. Father, bless this holy book now, and thy eternal word, in Jesus' name, amen. You can be seated. I want to preach you a message this morning about the names of God. The names of God. It's amazing at how many different Hebrew words are used in the Bible to refer to the same uh, being, that eternal being, Almighty God. Here in the book of Genesis, chapter number 1 and verse number 1, the first word that ever shows up in Scripture as it relates to God here in verse number 1 is the word Elohim. In Genesis 1-1, in the beginning, Elohim, or God, created the heaven and the earth. Elohim is a generic term in Hebrew, and it simply means a spirit being. But when it's used of God, it's talking about the eternal, absolute spirit being. For example, in the book of Deuteronomy, chapter number 6, and verse number 4, we read these words. Deuteronomy 6, 4. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, Elohim, is one Lord, one God, eternally existing, as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. For the Hebrew word Elohim is a plural Hebrew noun, which means three or more. Hebrew, unlike English, has singular, dual, and plural. English only has singular and plural. In Hebrew, dual, dual means two. In Hebrew, uh, plural means three or more. So here in Elohim, in the very first first verse in the Bible, the Blessed Trinity is brought to our view. And this word Elohim in chapter number 20 of the verse of Exodus says this, Exodus chapter number 20 and verse number 2, Exodus 22, I am the Lord thy God, which have brought thee out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. Thou shalt have no other Elohims before me no other gods before me. So Elohim can refer to the almighty, eternal, absolute being, or it can refer to a demon or a fallen angel, or in some cases in the Old Testament, to judges or magistrates or someone of that nature. So when we look at the word Elohim, we see a comparison, a contradistinction that is set in the word of God between almighty God and all of the other Elohim. In other words, he is God and all other spirit beings are subject to him because he's the Almighty and there's none like him. In the book of Exodus chapter number 3 and verse number 14, we read these words. Exodus chapter number 3 and verse 14, God said to Moses, I am that I am. And he said, Thus shalt thou say unto the children of Israel, I am hath sent me unto thee. This is the self-existing one. This is the eternal one. For in verse number 15, And God said moreover unto Moses, Thus shalt thou say unto the children of Israel, The Lord, God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob, hath sent me to you. This is my name forever, and this is my memorial unto all generations. Now when you're reading an English text, and there's certainly nothing wrong with our English Bible, you have to understand what he's saying here. This is my name. For the word Lord and the word God has showed up before that. But when you look into the text, you'll understand that the tetra tetragrammaton is in view here in Genesis chapter number 3 and verse number 15. It is those four Hebrew consonants, yod heh vau heh 
that represent the name of God. This is very important to understand this morning. A Jew will never pronounce that name. It is the ineffable name. What does that mean, preacher? It means that that name is so high and so holy and so precious to a Jew that he cannot even express it with the words, that it, words fail completely to say the name of God. And so therefore, he put Masoretic vowel points on that, 6th, 7th, 8th century, somewhere in there. And when he did, we get the name Jehovah. We get the name Jehovah because we have to have something to pronounce it with. There's no way to pronounce yod heh vow hey. That's the Tetragrammaton, the holy and effable name of God. So the only way we can do is to take what the Jew gives us and say Jehovah. There are those who say that it is Yahweh. Here's the problem. Nobody, nobody has ever heard a Jew say this name that comes out of his mouth. They've never heard it. No Gentile has ever heard a Jew pronounce yod heh vow hey. That's the name of God. That's his personal name. Nobody's ever heard that. So there's no way in the world that we can be so arrogant and dogmatic to condemn each other because some say it's Jehovah or some say it's Yahweh. I choose Jehovah. I choose Jehovah because the Masoretes put the vowel points on it and when they put the vowel points on it, we pronounce it that way. Who are the Masoretes, preacher? The Masoretes were the Jews who were responsible for the Masorah. The Masorah is the fence to the scripture. It is where they copied the word of God from one text to the other. They didn't have printing presses, so they had to copy it, hand copy it. That's what a scribe did. And the Masorah was the technical detail that he had in his lap to make dead certain that every jot, every tittle, every word was exactly the way it was from one text to the next. It is the preservation of the word of God. That's important, folks. You don't want mistakes. You don't want errors. You want the transmission of the Bible from one generation to the next generation to be absolutely accurate. A 57-foot-long scroll of Isaiah the prophet that was found in the Dead Sea Scrolls agrees with the King James Bible you've got in your hand because it was transmitted by the Jewish people who have far, far, far more respect for the Word of God than a Gentile does. And so these Jews had the school of the Masorah and they had the Masoretes who put the Masorite vowel points on yod he vow he And so when I say Jehovah today, I'm basing it entirely, completely, and absolutely upon what a Jew has done to the text. There are other, no other way to do it except that by that. But make no mistake about it. It's the name of God. It's his holy name. Now let me tell you something about the name of God. It is spelled J-E-S-U-S. There is no other name like that name. That is the name of Almighty God. So we find in the Bible, in the book of Exodus chapter number 15 and verse number 2. In Exodus 15 verse 2, the word of God says, The Lord is my strength and song and he has become my salvation. He is my God and I will prepare him an habitation. My Father's God and I will exalt him. Here you have a shortened verb, a shortened form of, of uh, Jehovah. You have Yah. That's an abbreviation of Jehovah. It's just another way of saying Jehovah, but in a shortened verse. In the book of Genesis chapter number 18 and verse number 27. Genesis chapter number 18 and verse number 27. And Abraham answered and said, Behold now, I have taken upon me to speak unto the Lord, which am but dust and ashes. That word Lord here in Genesis 18, verse number 27, is the Hebrew word Adonai. That's a precious name to the Hebrew people. For when they come to yod heh vau heh the Tetragrammaton, the unpronounceable name of God, they will come to that point in their scripture and they will say Adonai. They will pronounce Adonai instead of saying whatever they say. There's no way we know, as I say again, exactly how that word is pronounced because we've never heard a Jew pronounce it. But when he comes to the Tetragrammaton, he will say Adonai. And the word Adonai is a powerful word because it means Lord, it means Master, it means Owner. And so when Abraham spoke to these angels that had come and they were looking down at Sodom and Gomorrah, Abraham said, I am but dust and ashes. He was being reminded what God said to Adam, from dust thou art and into dust thou shalt return. If you want to know the true measure of what we are, folks, dust to dust, ashes to ashes, it takes an intervention from Almighty God 
for you to become any more than that. It takes God's hand and God's breath when he breathed into nostrils the breath of life and Adam became a living soul. It is that essence of God that flows forth from him to you that makes you what you are. When you're finished with that body, take it out and put it into the ground. Go back a hundred years later and all you'll find is dust. If there are no monuments, if there is no written record, if there is nothing left behind, it's as if you never existed. My, that takes down the pride. That affects our ego, doesn't it? But God breathed into Adam's nostrils and God's breath became the soul of man. And so Adonai is my Lord, Adonai is my master, and Abraham fully understood that. He said, I am just dust of the earth. God Almighty called him his friend. Abraham, in the book of Genesis, chapter number 14, verse 18, we find Melchizedek. In Genesis 14, 18, we read about Melchizedek, who is a mysterious individual in the Old Testament. He's mentioned again in the book of Hebrews, chapter 7. And Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought forth bread and wine, and he was the priest of the Most High God. The Most High God here gets us into these Elohistic combinations, El Elyon. He's the Most High God. What does that mean, preacher? He's Elohim joined with, El with Onolam, and that means that he is above all of these spirit beings. Nebuchadnezzar, Melchizedek understood that the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob was so far infinitely above all of creation, all demons, all angels, all spirit beings, that he resided alone. And Melchizedek stood for the most high God. These are concepts of God in the Old Testament long before the Lord Jesus Christ walked in the midst of them 2,000 years ago and said, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. Here we have an Old Testament Hebrew that had a strong understanding of the person and essence of Almighty God. He's called El Elyon. In Genesis chapter number 21 and verse number 20, 33, we read these words. Genesis 21, verse 33. The word of God says, And Abraham planted a grove in Beersheba and called there on the name of the Lord, the everlasting God. If he is everlasting, his salvation is everlasting. If he is everlasting, his forgiveness is everlasting. If he's everlasting, his life is everlasting. And he is from everlasting to everlasting. In the book of Revelation, he said, I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the ending. And so the Bible says here that the well of Beersheba, the seven lambs, here a covenant was made between God and Abraham. Abraham was an understanding. He had the essence of God revealed to him. He said, here we have the everlasting God. In plain words, if God's made a covenant with me, it's good today, it's good tomorrow, it'll be good forever. When the Lord Jesus Christ arose from the dead and went back to the Father, the Bible said he entered in with his own blood into the presence of Almighty God. And there ratified, dear friend, by sprinkling of that blood upon the altar, he brought into effect the new covenant, which is the new covenant of his blood. It is the new covenant that cleanses you of your sins. Without the shedding of blood, there is no cleansing, no forgiveness of sins. And God is bound to man by one thing, only one thing, not the commandments, not the church, not good works. He is bound to man by one thing. What's that preacher? The blood of his son. Amen. Nothing can cross the barrier of that blood. It binds God with man. It is the blood covenant. In the Old Testament, when Abraham walked between these things that had been cut asunder and he walked and there was a, it was a cold at night and it was, it was dark and yet the fire burned and the holiness of God consumed the sacrifice. It was there that Abraham began to understand that God makes a covenant whether men even know about it or not and when he ratifies that covenant and brings it into effect, nothing can change that. Folks, nothing, every demon in hell cannot change the blood covenant that was offered at Calvary. Hallelujah to God. That blood covenant is from the everlasting God. In the book of Genesis chapter number 17 and verse number 1, we read these words. In Genesis 17, 1. 
And when Abram was 90 years old and nine, the Lord appeared to Abram and said unto him, I am Almighty God. Walk before me and be thou perfect. Almighty here is El Shaddai. This is an Eloistic combination again. Elohim and Shaddai. God Almighty. I'm glad that I don't serve a lesser God. I'm glad I don't serve a created God. I'm glad I don't serve a God that's trying to do the best he can and reach the top. I'm glad I serve the only true and living God. Almighty God. That's no, my friend, let me tell you something today. Why would you trust your soul with anything less than Almighty God? Hallelujah. Revelation 1.8 said, He is the Almighty. He who? The Lord Jesus Christ. Identifying Him directly with Jehovah of the Old Testament is Christ of the New Testament. One and the same. Almighty God. Abraham, I know you. I know you're going to direct your family. I know you. I know you love me. I know you that you're different from everybody else on this earth. Abraham, walk before me. Be thou perfect. That word perfect means grow up, become mature, become dependent. Trust me. Walk before me. Let my life be lived out through your life. I am almighty God. Nothing will come your way that can separate the two of us. Nothing can come your way that I cannot completely and fully handle at the moment when it needs to be done. I am almighty God. I walk out of this house today glorifying, praising God because I serve an almighty God. Amen. Amen. Every demon of hell will have to give an account to almighty God. Hallelujah. Amen. In the book of Genesis chapter number 22 now, we come to the Jehovistic combinations of Jehovah. And remember that Jehovah is the Tetragrammaton, the ineffable name of God, the unspeakable name of God. In the book of Exodus, Genesis 22 and verse number 14, here's what it says in your Bible, 22, 14, Genesis. And Abraham called the name of that place Jehovah Jireh, as it is said to this day, in the mount of the Lord, it shall be seen. That word, in the mount of the Lord, it shall be seen, is a direct reference to, Mos uh, to Moriah because that's what Moriah means. It was at Moriah that Abraham took his son Isaac. He led him to that mountain. And there in the mind of Abraham, Isaac was a goner. He had already sacrificed him to God. It was just a matter of carrying out the deed, and God knew it. And when Abraham raised up that knife to plunge it into the heart of his son, God stayed his hand and said, Abraham, Abraham, that double call from heaven, I know you love me. I I know you love me. Well, he knew he loved him before he ever did it. Abraham knew now that he loved him. Abraham's faith had been put to the test. He came out of that trial. He realized that the greatest thing in his life was his love for Almighty God. God never does anything in your life for him to find out about it. He already knows what you're going to do. When he does it in your life, it is for you to find out about it. Boy, what a thing it does to your faith. When you realize, I do love him that much. I love him enough to lay my life down on the altar and give him the dearest thing to my soul. Once you reach that point in your life, then you begin to understand what it is to have a God who's a real God who's God. Yeah. Amen. And not a jack-in-the-box. Most Christians want instant religion, instant God, push the button, God pops up, they get what they want from God, and then they say, now I won't bother you again till I need you. Get back in your corner. And that is the way of most modern Christianity. Amen. God will provide. And he did provide. Has he provided for you, dear friend? Has he paid your bills, clothed you? Has he given you something to eat? Has he spared you from your enemies? If we only knew how many were coming against us. Thy, one of the old writers about 150 years ago, they write deep things about 200 years ago. They really do. You read what they say and you have to think through what they're saying. There's, and one wrote this and it said, it will never be known. We will never comprehend it. We will never understand the depths of the suffering and the greatness of the love of the Lord Jesus Christ for his father when he went to the cross until we get to glory. 
And you've got to let that sink in. You've got to let it settle into your heart and into your soul at how much Christ was willing to give himself for us so that we could be saved. The passion he endured, what he suffered on the cross, friend, was more than the physical pain he suffered in his soul. The Bible says in the book of Isaiah, thou shalt see the travail of his soul and will be satisfied. Boy, nobody could see that but God the Father. And when God's Son offered himself to the Father, the Father saw the Son and he was satisfied. Boy, for all the sins of mankind, for that vicarious suffering of the one that loved us, every dirty, rotten, stinking, low-down thing you've ever done, he paid for it. He carried it in his body on the tree, and there he died and suffered and bled so that we could be saved. Hallelujah. Jehovah Jireh. Exodus chapter 15, verse number 26. Notice how that all of this, all practically every one of these are found in the Pentateuch, the basis of the Bible, folks. Listen carefully. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. That is the foundation of the Word of God. That is the Pentateuch. This is the, original, this is the original foundation of Scripture. God said, Moses, write a book. And the book that he wrote was Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. Everything in the Bible is built upon those first five books. They are very important. And here we read in the book of uh, Exodus chapter number 15 and verse number 26. It says this. If thou wilt diligently hearken to the voice of the Lord thy God, and do that which is right in his sight, give ear to his commandments, keep all his statutes, I will put none of these diseases upon thee, which I have brought upon the Egyptians, for I am the Lord that healeth thee. Boy, has God ever healed you? Has he really ever healed you? Now, I'm four doctors, you know that. Good God bless a good doctor. Got no problem with doctors, medicine, hospitals, and, and, and surgeries and all that. I see their place, and I've seen their benefit time and time and time again. But I've seen God heal people long before the doctor could ever touch them. I've seen God heal directly out of prayer. I've seen God heal in, 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 in hopeless circumstances when nobody could do anything, and the doctors had completely given up on the individual. Friend, let me tell you who's got the last word. The last word is never the doctor's word. Word. The last word is the Lord's word. I am the Lord that healeth thee. His healing can be instantaneous. His healing can be gradual. He can use things to heal with. God has his own manner and his own way and his own time to heal. But God Almighty can heal. Amen. I was just reading the testimony of an Iranian woman the other day. She was a devout Muslim. Her daughter was a devout Muslim. Her daughter hated Jesus Christ, and so did she. But the mother came down with an incurable disease, and the doctors couldn't do a thing to help her. And so in desperation, she turned to the name of Jesus. Her family turned against her. All of her friends turned against her. And you can't imagine what would happen in a Muslim country. When you turn, you become an apostate. And they can kill you because you are an apostate. But in her desperate hour, in her greatest hour of need, she said, what's it going to hurt? I'm going to call on the name of Jesus. And she cried out to him. And you know what? He healed her. He healed her completely. Her daughter saw that her mother had been healed. She couldn't explain it away. The doctor said we didn't do it because she'd been given a hopeless case. Nobody could take credit for it. And the doctor and the daughter got saved because her mother got saved. Here are two Muslims in Iran, right smack in the middle of Muslim land. And both of them got saved by the grace of God. You'd be surprised at how many people in places like Iraq and Iran and, and other uh, Muslim countries are meeting in secret because they've been born again by the power of Almighty God. Can God heal? I am the Lord, he said, that healeth thee. That Bible says in the Old Testament that by his stripes we are healed, Isaiah chapter number 53. But when you come to the New Testament and he quotes that Old Testament passage, he 
changes one word. In the New Testament, it doesn't say by his stripes we are healed. In the New Testament, it says by his stripes we were healed. That's a reference back to the cross at Calvary. That's a reference back to the atonement. In other words, it was all made possible on the cross at Calvary. Does God heal every time? No, I haven't seen him heal every time. I'd like to, but it's not my call. Do I always pray for the sick? Absolutely. If you ask me to pray for you, I'm going to pray for God to raise you up and heal you. I'll leave it in his hands. He'll be the one that makes the decision. But this is one preacher right here that believes that he heals. There's no question about it. God heals. Amen. There's a vast difference, my dear friend, between theoretical faith and real faith. Most Christians have theoretical faith because they've never really been put to the test. They've never really come down and seen the green, uh, grim reaper eyeball to eyeball. They've never felt the chilling hand of death. But you ever walk through the valley of the shadow of death one time and feel it breathing down your back and have its touch come upon your life and know that you have but a short time left. Your theoretical faith gets down to practical terms. It's there that you really decide, can God heal me? Well, I cry out to him to heal. I hope and pray it's the latter. I pray that when you come down to that hour, when everybody says, no, there is no hope, there is no cure, you can't be healed, you look at them and say, appreciate it, appreciate all you've done for me, but it's not over yet. And go off into your closet somewhere, hallelujah, and cry out to God and ask him to heal you. Amen. And leave it in his hands. I've seen him heal. I've seen him heal. In the book of Exodus, chapter number 17, verse 15, the word of God says this, another Jehovistic combination. Exodus 17 and 15, and Moses built an altar and called the name of it Jehovah Nissi, the Jehovah Nissi. And who are we talking about? In verse number, right before then, the verses preceding that, in verse 14, Amalek. Amalek is forever, not just defeated one time. He's not, like, uh, he's not like the Philistines. Amalek is from generation to generation to generation. You never get him completely defeated. You keep him at bay. You keep him away. You keep him bound up. You see, Amalek represents the flesh. He represents the flesh. And here, notice carefully, in Exodus chapter number 17 and verse number 15, the Lord says that he used the term Jehovah Nissi. That means Jehovah is our banner. That's what we fight under. That's who is our commander. That's who we belong to. And we war not with carnal things, but with spiritual things. The weapons of our warfare, but it is a warfare. We're in this thing to win, friend, and we're serious about what we're doing here today. This ain't a game. This is not a joke. Your eternity is at stake. Where you're going to spend forever is in view this morning. Where are you going when you leave here? You might walk through that back door and before you ever get to your car, something grabs you and you fall to the flat on your face down to the pavement and you're gone before you hit the ground. Can somebody die that fast, preacher? You better believe they can. You can be dead before you hit the ground. You can leave this body just like that. And there's no time to get ready. There's no standing around the bed and calling in the preacher. There's no opportunity for that sometimes. The only opportunity you got is the one you got right now. When you call upon his name and you cry out to him and say, Oh, Jesus, I don't want to leave here unprepared. I don't want to go out into eternity, into the darkness, lost without God. I want to be saved. And he'll save you. He's the Savior of all things. He's the Savior. That's the greatest name he has. He's prouder of that name than any name he's got. He's the Savior. He's the only Savior. He's the Savior of mankind, our Lord Jesus Christ. And so the banner that I fight under today is the banner of the cross. It's the banner of the blood. It's the banner of Jesus. It's the banner of the word of God. It's the banner of eternal truths. It's the banner of whether you're saved or lost. Where are you going when you leave here? To heaven or to hell? There's a man sitting on the fourth row right there in that blue shirt. He told me just a few minutes ago, he said, Preacher, he said, I got saved off your hell message. I thought, my, 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 my. God bless your soul. Hallelujah. He got saved listening to the message on hell. I preached that message two or three times. First time I preached it was back in the 80s. Been 30 something years ago. The message on hell. And I've seen a lot of people get saved since then. 
they put it, that thing on YouTube. I didn't put it. I don't post anything on YouTube, but other people do. And that message has been posted on YouTube. And I think it's over 300,000 hits by now, maybe even more than that, that people are coming individually and they're looking and they're, and they're watching the message and you ought to read some of the posts. I'll get on there occasionally and I'll read what one said. Read one the other day and said, this man's completely insane. <laughs> He's lost it. <laughs> I thought, appreciate it. <laughs> I've had worse things said about me. <laughs> and then another one comes along and says, Amen, preacher. That's what we need to hear today. And But here's the bottom line. If I spent all my time reading what people say about me on YouTube, I'd go, I'd go bananas, you see. But I get on there occasionally to see about those, and here's one that comes up and says, Yeah, I saw this, I heard this message, and now I'm saved. Hallelujah. I get a lot of that by watching what, they, what they've done there on YouTube. Well, let me tell you something. I didn't create hell and I didn't die on Calvary. It's not my blood that saves you. I'm a messenger. My job's to preach his word. I'm happy preaching his word. That's the greatest thing that this preacher could do. Amen. I could do nothing that is as wonderful that God's given me the liberty to stand up and proclaim eternal truths, the living word of the living God. I'm happy, friend. I am, believe me. I am glory. God has blessed my soul to be able to stand up and preach his eternal word. Amen. I'm just a messenger. That's all I am. That's all I ever want to be. The one I serve is infinitely greater than I am. Hallelujah to God. Bless his holy name. Hallelujah. Bless the name. Amen. Bless his name, not mine. Glory to the Lamb. Hallelujah to the Lamb. Bless the Lamb of God with all my soul and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. You ever get drawn out over hell and be shaken out over a thing like that and feel the heat coming up out of your soul and then you get saved and know you're never going to go to hell, you'll have something to shout about. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen, amen. Where was I? Doesn't matter. God's good God. Amen. Hallelujah. Book of Exodus chapter 31 verse 13. Exodus 31 13. We read these words. Speak thou also to the children of Israel, saying, Verily my Sabbaths ye shall keep. Sabbaths and far more than just one every week. There are many other Sabbaths in Israel. You shall keep the... Uh, 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 for it is, let me go back to verse 13. Where am I? Exodus 31, 13. Speak thou to the children of Israel, saying, Verily my Sabbaths ye shall keep. For it is a sign between me and you throughout your generations that ye may know that I am the Lord that doth sanctify you. Hallelujah. Yeah. Amen. Amen. You remember when Sanballat and Tobiah came over there and they were trying to build the walls and they wanted to take part in what they were doing. You remember them, Sanballat and Tobiah? And they sent word back and said, you neither have part nor lot in what we're doing. You're wasting your time. Doesn't matter what you do, you don't belong to us. Let me tell you something. I'm in the congregation of the righteous this morning. I'm walking among the saved. I live with the redeemed. My name is in the Lamb's book of life. I've been covered by the blood of Christ. My sins have been forgiven. I'm at home here, amen. I'm not, a, I'm not a stranger. This is where I belong. Are you listening to me? Do you feel like a foreigner in here? Do you feel like a square peg in a round hole? Do you feel like you don't fit? Well, yeah, I'm big in my church. That's, I don't care anything about your church. Your church means nothing to me. Do you know the Lord Jesus Christ? Have you been born again? Isn't there something about it? Do you feel a camaraderie when you come in here? When you walk among God's people? When you hear some old sorry low down dog tell you how God saved him and brought him up out of hell, changed his life and gave him something to live for? Does it move a warmness in your heart? Do you feel a drawing toward that individual? Do you see something in him that was in you? Do you say, glory to God, hallelujah, I'm so glad for you. Thank God that he forgives. Or does it offend your self-righteousness? Does it offend your ego? This is, well, I got up one time, preached a funeral. I got up and a bunch of people in that funeral, and they were sitting out there listening to me. And I'm telling you the truth, I just got up there and started preaching the gospel, and I had every kind of look. I mean, I had some women that looked at me. I couldn't believe a face would show so many emotions. I couldn't believe it. I'm serious. I mean, I got hate and fires and, and uh, shooting out there toward me. They didn't like me at all. And you know what I told them? I said, Jesus is the only way. There's no other way. He's the Savior of all men. 
He's the Savior of all mankind, whether you're a Baptist, a Methodist, a Presbyterian, a Roman Catholic, whatever, it makes no difference. If you are not born again, your church won't get you to glory. Amen. And that offends a lot of people. Hallelujah. Amen, amen. I done lost it. Where am I? Here it is, Judges 6, 24. I love it when the Holy Ghost shows up, though. Amen. Amen. Judges chapter number 6. Judges chapter number 6 and verse number 24. Here we are, Judges 6, 24. Then Gideon built an altar there to the Lord and called it Jehovah Shalom. See that? There it's spelled out for you this time. Unto this day it is yet in Ophrah, the Abiezrites. He called it Jehovah Shalom. Now you know what the word Shalom means in Hebrew. I'm sure you've heard it a thousand times. It means peace. Yerushalayim is the city of peace. Shalom. Abba Shalom. The son of David. Absalom. He is the father of peace. He brought anything but peace to his father and to Jerusalem and to Israel. Amen. Why? Because there's only one peace. Amen. Just one. I believe I've got it over here in the book of Ephesians, chapter number 2 and verse 14. If you'd like to turn there with me. Ephesians 2, 14. This is becoming a house of prayer this morning. Thank God. Thank God. Thank God. Amen. Ephesians 2, 14. If you feel a need to pray, start praying now. Yeah. There may be a reason the Holy Ghost wants you praying, dear friend. Remember, I'm just the messenger. I don't control anything. If the Holy Ghost wants you praying, start praying. Ephesians 2.14, For he is our peace, who hath made both one, and hath broken down the middle wall of partition between us. Why, my goodness gracious, peace is now a person. <laughs> Amen. It's not a thing. It's not so much a gift. It's a person. Just like salvation is a person. Do you realize that when you receive the Lord Jesus Christ, you have received everything the Old Testament saint looked for in all the covenant relationships, in all the Elohistic combinations, Jehovistic combinations, all of the names, El Elyon, El Nolam, and, 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 the, and the Tetragrammaton, and all that, it's all wound up in one person. When you have the Lord Jesus Christ, you've got everything. All right. I'll close with this one. I love this one. Jeremiah 23, verse 6. Jeremiah 23, verse 6. He's one they call one of the old major prophets in the Old Testament, Hebrew prophet. Jeremiah chapter 23, verse 6. But he's no more of a prophet than Nahum. Or any of the short, they call them minor prophets. Major and minor prophet is an absolute arbitrary designation created in somebody's lab. Amen. God doesn't see major and minor prophets. He's either a prophet or he's not a prophet. They do all by the length of the book. Jeremiah 23 and verse number 6. In his days Judah shall be saved. Israel shall dwell safely. And this is his name whereby he shall be called the Lord our righteousness. Amen. Now I'm going to give you a little test this morning. <laughs> Who is that? That's not Preacher Lawson. No, that's not the president. Who is the Lord our righteousness? There's only one that can fit that bill. Now, let me say something to you, and I've said it many times before, but I won't say it again before I, before I close. It's been good to be here this morning. When the Lord Jesus Christ came 2,000 years ago, folks, he lived a sinless life. And we believe that. Sinless, perfect life. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Sinless. When he finished that life after 33 and a half years, all of his life had accrued a measure of righteousness, which was his righteousness, his righteousness, his righteousness. In other words, it was righteousness that had come about because a man had lived on this earth in perfect. He was perfect. So it's the righteousness of the Son of God. Now, if an individual is born again by the grace of God, what Jesus Christ accomplished in his lifetime, being absolutely righteous, is given to you. He becomes your righteousness. That's why the Apostle Paul said he has made unto us righteousness. So the righteousness that God gives you today is the righteousness of a sinless man who lived 2,000 years ago 
lived a perfect life, and now seated at the right hand of the Father. Now, this is the last thing I'll say. How did he get into heaven? How did Christ get into heaven? Do you realize that nothing could ever just approach God and go into heaven on its own? Do you know how he did it? He did it by his own righteousness. When he approached the throne of God, he approached the throne of God based on his sinless, perfect life. And you know what the Father did? He welcomed him. That's a big deal. That means that the righteous one sitting on the throne, God the Father, is God the Father righteous. That means that the one sitting to his right hand, a man who had lived 33 and a half years on this earth, is just as righteous as the one sitting on the throne. Boy, that's a big deal. Big deal. Big deal. This is why he's the last Adam, second man. I get the benefit of that. He's my Adam now. I'm in him. My life came from him. I come through him from him. My Lord Jesus Christ is the source of what I am. Father, in thy name we pray. Bless your holy word, and you already have, Lord. You've blessed the messenger, and I thank you again for that. I'm happy, Lord. I'm happy being the messenger. My life is so fulfilled. You have blessed me so much. I am what I am by the grace of God. And I am so glad and so thankful to be a messenger. I pray now for those who've gathered together in this house that they won't listen to Satan, the liar, the deceiver. But they'll come to you. They'll come to you because you're drawing them. Because you show them you love them. Because you show them you'll forgive them. You show them that you'll take them in your arms and carry them like a little lamb. I pray this in Jesus' holy name, and for yes. Jesus' sake we ask it, and amen. Let's stand up this morning. What have we got, brother? Page 306.